I am Jeff Foxworthy and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. All right, everybody, welcome to West Point, Mississippi, home of Mossy Oak brand camo, and you better fasten your seatbelt today. That's right. That this is going to be a, listen to that. <laughs> I hope we don't get in any kind of legal trouble by playing that, Richie. But we'll, we'll soon find out. We'll soon find out, that's right. <laughs> we'll find out who's listening. So, we've, you know, we've done a lot of podcasts. I think this is about our 180th. Oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. But this is going to be really... This is a an big interesting one. discussion. For epic us, epic no for me. Epic, epic, no doubt epic, about it. Yep. Yeah. So uh, you know, Toxie, when you you've been around here a long time, you've been around a long time. Well, back, careful, careful now. <laughs> back at those, remember those sock hops that you used to go yeah. to? Yeah. No, was, that was actually I was older when those. You know, I outgrew those. You know, <laughs> so yeah, the, the the dancers back yeah. when we were in the yeah, tenth well, and eleventh grade. Yeah, we did the jitterbug mostly in my generation. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, where Whatever. I was, that the Almond Brothers band were a big deal. It's a big deal, no question about yeah. it. So, look, let me just go ahead and introduce him. I don't know any other way to do it, but we've got a guest. Through the magic of the internet, we've got Mr. Chuck Lavelle. Bring the horn. And, and <laughs> so how do I say this? I mean, this guy was a, part of the Almond Brothers band. He's part of the Rolling Stones. He's been on so much. He's just a... Musical icon. He no really and truly So is. everybody no. watching or listening to this, go pull it up. Download it, whatever, and watch The Tree Man. The Tree Man. I have rarely looked at something that was rated 100% Rotten Tomatoes, but this one is. Yeah. And it is indeed, because it's just it's just a walk in life with Chuck, and it's so good. Yeah, it's a great History story. of the band, the music, and then also his care for the earth and love of trees. It's incredible. It, D- Dudley. Yeah, so mm. I'm I'm a huge live music fan. and uh, You like I, trees too, don't you? Yeah, and I love <laughs> trees. And I want uh, maybe in 1994, um, I saw Chuck on stage in Memphis uh, uh, with the Rolling Stones. Wow. And uh, wow. about that same time, I read a magazine article in the National Wild Turkey Federation that, uh, that was all about Chuck and, and what he does. And, and ever since then, he's kind of been my beacon, you know, like uh, he's also into trees, into the outdoors, and uh, we have very similar musical taste. So this is a big deal. Ever since we've had a podcast, I, this was the one I wanted to have. And bucket took, bucket and, list. Uh, I was on a flight and saw the tree man. And I said, I think we've got a chance of getting him on and, and talking about it because we're so similar. Yeah, no doubt about it. So. Yeah. Hey, look, Chuck, I'm going to be honest with you. He hasn't slept in three nights. <laughs> He's so excited about it. I bet that. Chuck has. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, gentlemen, first of all, it's just great to be with you. Thank you, fellas, for inviting me. I, I love uh, everything that Mossy Oak does. You guys have such a beautiful brand, and, and uh, I'm very, very proud and honored to be on your podcast. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, it so we a lot. We, we've we've looking around the room we talked about it where how are we going to get started what are we going to ask i know everybody's got a bunch of questions but chuck before we get started there's a, just one little piece of business we need to kind of i, I want to talk about real, just real fast but we have a segment called blood on the biologic and as hunting season approaches you know a lot of times we point out folks that have had successful hunts we really guys i'd really like to get kids more kids involved in this so please just hashtag us that that hashtag blood on the biologic and we'll see them but lanny i wanted to show you dave larson what dave larson and why and and uh Oh. Wisconsin killed a great big old black bear. Look at there, we got visuals. Look at Dave Larson from Core Resources. They make the Gamekeeper clothes. That's a big old bear. Yeah, he was real excited. Dudley, he said there's more acorns this year up there than he can remember. He said all the deer are super fat. The bears have a lot to eat. But guys, I want to show you one more picture. Look at this uh, Colton Goodwin. Look at the look at the wow. rack on this deer. Wow. And he's got his sheds from the year before. Mm-hmm. Can you get, can you, if I told you that that was killed in the South, would you believe me? That's a giant deer. North Carolina. Wow. wow. 
It's incredible. You know, that almost might, looks he, like some of those big city deer people kill around Atlanta. Yeah. Might know, be. Big old high and tight. That deer was definitely eaten by a logic just looking at his horn. I'm just going to tell you. Incredible. <laughs> Incredible. I would agree with you. Congratulations, guys. And uh, so that's what we had, Blood on the Biologic, brought to you by LS Tractors. And Chuck, I apologize. I don't think you could see those images, but trust us, they were they were really pretty. They yeah, were. So, look, we, we've thought about this. I want to, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask the first question. Chuck. Of course you would. So I've watched the tree man, <laughs> and Matt, you need to jump in here too. Watch the tree man and, and understand this farm you've got over there in Georgia. And I've been thinking about all kinds of questions I could ask you. And the first thing I wanted to ask you is, do you have any turkeys? <laughs> <laughs> and if so, could I come over there this next spring? He never ends. Never well, ends. let's see what we can do. Let's see what we can do. Yeah, we've, we've had um, a fair turkey season. Last year was a little bit off. Um, two to three years ago, the numbers were really, really strong. So, uh, you know, yes, we do have them. Uh, not quite as many as I would like to have. At there's present, no such but, thing, is it? There's no such thing as too many. Yeah, right. that's no, right. that's, that's right. <laughs> but, you not know, when, when, when you realize uh, what the state of Georgia did, and I can't remember exactly when it was, but it was probably close to 30 years ago, I guess, uh, where there was hardly any turkeys in the state, and they closed the season, and they stocked turkeys, and it's just been an incredible success story uh, throughout the state. So uh, that's, that's, that's amazing. Glad glad to say that we do have them. <clears throat> Music to our ears. We're yep. so blessed to have the population we have. But the good news is everybody is so concerned about preservation for the future. I say almost everybody. And it's really raised the awareness of what's going on today and funded a lot of really meaningful research. There's a lot of great projects there going is. on today. Sure is. Well, look, before Dudley pees on himself here, so we, <laughs> go ahead, Dudley. Well, uh, I really just want you to go over some of the things you're doing uh, so our listeners can can understand, uh, you know, your purpose here. Um, I've been studying up on America's Forest with Chuck um, and really enjoying watching that series. Um, and you, you just seem to shine a light on the, the forestry and forest products industry in general um and we're talking about you know trees that you know naturally occur here um and they and they do grow back um so can you just go into the details a little bit about about what about that show um you know some of the places you've been the you know the process absolutely uh so for those that may not know um america's forest with chuck lavelle is, runs on pbs and it's also available on Amazon Prime. So if anybody wants to uh, just, you know, call that up, you can find it easily. Uh, you guys probably know that I've written some books on the subject of forestry and, and the environment. And uh, I also, from time to time, give presentations and speeches to various different groups trying to help educate uh, people on the importance of forestry and environment and the natural world. And through this process and through the years, I thought to myself, you know, the best way to get these messages out would really be to have a television program. And so uh, my partner, Bruce Ward, and I got together and we kicked around some ideas and kicked around some titles. And we came up with uh, the idea of America's Forest. And so this gives us a chance to go throughout the country uh, finding these incredible stories of people that are doing <clears throat> beautiful things that have to do with, uh, and, and by the way, it's not all just about the forest, it's about what's within the forest, largely uh, wildlife, just about every segment and uh, episode we've done has something about wildlife in it. We've had the, uh, the grouse uh, program, we've had wild turkey, you mentioned, uh, uh, deer, you know, everything. So, uh, that's the whole impetus is to have a fun program. We have a little music in it. Being a musician, that's a pretty natural thing to do. Try to have some humor in it, but also talk about all the problems that we do face, uh, the challenges, things like wildfires out in California and the, and the Pacific Northwest and other places, what's being done to help prevent those wildfires, uh, forest products that you were so kind to mention a little bit earlier, uh, you know, I like to tell people 
Our trees give us uh, materials to build our homes, schools, churches, offices, to make books, magazines, and newspapers. They clean our air, they clean our water. Mm. And uh, mm. of course, there's the incredible aesthetic value that we all appreciate about forests. It's amazing. Yeah, it's really cool at the, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but, uh, you know, at the end, he'll get together with some local musicians and put on a little show. Um, That's incredible. They'll, you know, they'll just showcase the culture of yeah. that area. Um, you know, you may go to a, a like, a, I don't know, in, in Aspen Grove and go snowmobiling and look around. You may go fishing. It's really cool. Everybody needs to watch it. Yeah, one of the episodes I watched was in the Wachita, uh, in, in Arkansas, in the Wachita Arkansas. Forest. Man, it was amazing just seeing the culture. And then uh, uh, one of the ladies that you had on there, she was uh, paddling through those, those uh, I think it was Tupelo gum cypress uh, or stumps. Yes. In, and I, in a breakup canoe, in a mossy oak canoe, by the cool. way. Got taste. And look, <laughs> hand grabbed a water snake, a big one. I mean, just rode up there and pulled it up, man. It, it's really entertaining. So I really enjoyed it to, to Dudley's point because we often, you know, us here, we, we, we tend to micro focus on the forest and it really showed me the impact that forest has not only on the culture and the people and the wildlife and everything. So good job. Well, so we have just, a lot of fun with it. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, we try to have uh, a little humor in there yeah. as well, but it, it's really meant to be an educational show. And you guys know this, there, there's so many misconceptions and uh, uh, just misgivings uh, that a lot of people have about what we do as hunters, as um, you know, uh, people that, that manage land and look after the land. And we were talking uh, before the actual broadcast began about how the mantra is to leave our land in better shape than we found it. Mm -hmm. That's certainly the mantra that I try to live by. 100%. And that's the mantra that we try to project with the program. It's so important. Um, you know, you're similar in that you're just following your passion, just right out there into the public eye and trying to make a difference. But, you know, in today's world with all the poison going on out there, literally, spiritually politically you know and obviously from environmental poisons and stuff too uh, we can't stick our head in the sand it's been so easy through the last years of the great american story to just stick your head in the sand it'll take care of yourself what are you so worried about it for whether it's the you know the national debt or anything else too but when you start losing something you love you change your tune a little bit and so for us you know the wild turkey is I mentioned that a minute ago has changed, but people don't see the forest effect, not the average, you know, living in a city, not around the stuff. And so for Chuck to be able to raise the awareness of that, we better, I would say, pay as much or more attention to trees in this earth than anything going on. Maybe the oceans come first, but beyond that, and I'm not a, I'm an environmentalist at heart. I'm not trained as one. But we better pay attention is all I'm getting to. And I know people criticize I'm a little preachy on this show, but when you're talking about the <laughs> earth we live on and the critters, sorry, I will be preachy. I just thank you, Chuck, for bringing that awareness to everybody and, you know, the truth. And the, what the good thing is that more and more people, you know, through our own uh, nursery and selling trees and all, we've just tried to always put the tools in people's hands and so everybody can participate. And, uh, you know, it seems like every year more and more people are diverting more of their, like, land management budget to replanting trees. If you ever get them started, and then in subsequent years they see the results, then you got them hooked. And they start doing a little bit every year, and they realize that golden message that my dad said that we all kind of live by here as gamekeepers. The good that men do will live long after they're gone. Yep. What a cool thing. Well you, said. You well embody said. it. I mean, you big time embody it. Your daughter's been begging you to hunt since her little brother shot the big eight last year. You've ran a fire, dissed the fields, got stuck, got unstuck. Planted food plots, fertilized, and prayed for rain. You moved trees, limbed roads, even bought one of those fancy cell cameras. So what's your excuse? LS Tractor. Nosler Ballistic Tip Ammunition is made for knocking down deer right where they stand. Nosler's Ballistic Tip Bullet is the key. It has the controlled expansion and bone crushing punch to turn a whitetail's lights out. Bring home more deer this year with Ballistic Tip Ammunition. 
buy now at nosler.com. I think we were talking a little bit before the podcast also about uh, how you're just a, a perfect vehicle for this because you're in touch with all different types of people uh, through your music ventures. And a lot of those people may not understand uh, how ecosystems work uh, in a, a forested setting. Right. Um, and you're the perfect person to relay, yeah. relay that information to the whole world. Um, yeah, he's got the platform. So thanks for doing that, by the way. <laughs> Chuck, why don't you squeeze a word in here, please? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have had a pen and paper. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, what are some of the things you enjoy doing at your own place in Georgia? What are some, maybe some uh, treatments you do to your trees or, you know, what do you like to do out there? Well, we were talking earlier, uh, I think uh, you guys have a prescribed burn coming up today, yep. later on. And uh, certainly, of course, this time of year, most of the burns that, that we do around here are for site prepping mm -hmm. to plant trees right. uh, because we're in the warm weather time. Uh, but our prescribed burns usually start somewhere around February, maybe March, go into April, uh, and uh, that's certainly an activity that I enjoy because I think it's one of the best tools that landowners have to manage their land. Of course, you have to be extremely careful and uh, you have to know what you're doing. You have to be educated about it, uh, but it is an incredible tool. So, you know, that's one of the activities we do, but, you know, planting feed plots uh, for the deer, for the quail, for the, for the turkey, um, we have a commercial quail hunting operation here at Charlene, uh, C-H-A-R-L-A-N-E. And the way we came up with uh, that name is the first uh, few letters of my proper name, Charles, C-H-A-R, and my wife's middle name is Lane, L-A-N-E. How about that? So we came up with Charlene Woodlands. And uh, our season runs from uh, mid-October until mid March with the quail hunting. Uh, we have a lodge. We, we have several accommodations that we enjoy putting people up. Uh, great cooks, uh, great guides, and wow. the jeeps, the dogs. Uh, and so I engage in that. Uh, one of the things I like doing, guys, is we'll get the customers out into the field and then I'll go to the horse barn, saddle up a horse and go visit the various hunting parties and of course that adds a little bit of color to the operation awesome. and uh, helps us to socialize with our clients and we've been doing this since the early 90s you know it's like music to me man you yeah. know I love yeah. doing it it's an honor it's a pleasure to do it and uh, and we enjoy it so uh, you know that's that's coming up pretty quick we're here in September so October's around the corner and we'll we'll start our activities there so Charlene is located in south central Georgia Really, it's right in the middle of the state. There's a <clears throat> there's a uh, a plaque uh, not far from us, probably three quarters of a mile away, that indicates the geographical center of Georgia. Okay, so Hi. we are literally in the center of the state. We're we're below Macon, about twenty miles. Okay. How about that? Yeah. We may have to book a book an afternoon over there, Bobby. Yeah. That would be Come fun. on, guys. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, Chuck, I grew up, that was my rite of passage, really was the quail hunting at the time. My dad was a cattle buyer for Brian Foods, and so he would, and a lot of, <clears> most <throat> of his sales he bought from were in Alabama. He'd go as far as Selma and over, I forgot where, a little bit east of there, and, uh, but he would take his bird dogs and put them in the trunk of his car, put, tie the a little rope to keep, they could get air in there and had food and water and stuff for them, and then after the sale, probably three or four times a week. Of course, every cattle owner wanted him to go with them because he was the largest buyer of cattle because of the Mr. Bryan's operation here. Anyway, he quail hunted every day of the week, say four days a week, um, probably for six or eight, 10 years. And that was his thing. Quail. So I grew up <clears throat> on a farm, a wild buck, and that's one of the first things I was able to do when I was old enough to take a gun and go by myself is, he had one dog he'd let me take, old Mike, and that was it because he knew he would stay real close to me and wouldn't get lost. And so I can't even tell you how many hundreds of days I would go bird hunting, and I'd be so excited if I killed one or two. But we had a lot of birds back then. So love that modern-day quail operations are keeping that alive, you know, for people to experience, and with especially the dogs and all that, it's just, it's just yeah. magic. 
Well, you know, and, and as you guys, I'm sure would agree, it's not uh, about how many times you pull the trigger. No. But it's about just being outdoors, uh, being able to get the exercise of walking uh, behind the dogs, watching those dogs work. That's so fascinating to me. And I, I love that you gave me that story because I have a similar one, even though for me it happened much later in life. Uh and by the way, uh, my wife and I, Rose Lane, has uh, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary. Wow! Congratulations! Hit the oh, horns, yeah, wow. yes, sir. That's, that's incredible. Amazing. Thank you. That is amazing. Thank you. But but the way I got into it, guys, was um, I was invited by the family to a dove shoot, and I had never been on a dove shoot before. And of course, I think I was maybe 20 years old at the time, and uh, I was in the corner of the field with Rose Lane's uh, uncle, whom we affectionately call Baby Joe. <laughs> and Baby Joe weighed about, you know, 250 pounds. He was uh, a very big man, very stocky and a, a wonderful guy. You know, I'm missing every dove that flies by me. And all of a sudden a covey of quail burst, you know, scared the bejesus out of me. And I said, dang, Joe, what was that? And Joe said, them birds, boy, you want to go, go bird hunting? I said, I reckon I do. <laughs> he showed up at the house the next day, just as you described. He had uh, a couple of shotguns in the back seat of a, a Chevrolet uh, Impala right. with two bird dogs in the trunk. Yep, exactly. And we went around every field that the family had, and I had the time of my life, and I was hooked. Mm. Yes, how about that? That's a great story. And Bobby, yeah. Bobby always has just He's coveted. Over there. Yes, yeah, I love Bobby <laughs> loves love, to quail hunt. Love I mean, dogs. it's it's it is it is magic. You know, the only thing, even you know, we have a in Mr. Gibson. I think he raises a few German short hairs, but we have a dog kennel here. We raise dogs and trains dogs, largely British Labradors, which we adore. Watching the wow. dog work, we just don't have. There's some, and there's some really good ones in this area, but they're not as many. I mean, Georgia is known for the best, you know, commercial quail hunting that there is in the country. It's just known for it. It's spread through there so much. I wish we had more, and uh, I wish more people could own the bird dogs and had something to do with them. Personally, for us, um, you know, we, we're starting to see the more I burn, the more wild quail we keep seeing. And they, they're yeah. starting to come back, actually. I now, think it's a trend. You know, a lot of, a lot of folks are now – understanding the importance of the early successional habitat yes. you know at their at their own farms and and yeah. because of that we're starting to you know the turkey poults are becoming yeah, more yeah, successful yeah. quail are being more successful so maybe we're going in the right direction again i hope the the biggest light bulb that went off with me in doing these and listening to so many good biologists was the the guy from oklahoma state who was the rio <clears throat> expert in he explained why they have so many quail in Texas and Oklahoma still. He said, our habitat is so poor. Our soils are so poor and arid that our habitat can never get out of that first, that early successional stage. We have perfect nesting habitat perpetually where, you know, at your farm or at ours, we've got to manage to keep some of that in that early succession for optimal. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's amazing how that burning even in growing pine plantations will give you that same effect yeah especially if you have a slightly wider spacing than exactly normally recommended well you know when when i first started uh, learning about this uh the the bible of of quail management was uh, written by a guy named herbert stoddard back in the 30s and he was hired to do um a, a you know very lengthy study by a lot of the landowners in South Georgia and in other parts of the South. And then uh, years later, Walter Rosine followed up in the 60s with another book concerning the uh, habitat. And But it, it really goes to what you guys are just saying, you know, to the early successional frequent burning. As we know, we, you want to checkerboard things up and leave some nesting habitat when you're doing these burns and whatnot. But uh, if you manage it, I was just thinking when you guys were talking about it, build it and they will come. Right? Yes, that's right. Like that's if right. you have the habitat, you're going to have the birds. Just wondering, you know, obviously I've noticed, you know, intense management of pines and, 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 and those kind of things. I just didn't know, uh, do you do much hardwood tree management? And if you did, you know, do you have a species that you really like to focus on? Well, you know, most of what we have is uh, – 
what we would term so Southern yellow pine, of course, loblolly, some slash. And then there has been, as you guys know, an effort uh, through the last probably 30 years to reintroduce longleaf pine. I noticed that. Um, yes. Which used to be the dominant pine species from uh, Virginia down to East Texas. And we have engaged in that. I think we have about 350 acres of longleaf that we've planted through the years. Wow. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, we have some upland and lowland hardwoods. Uh, you know, don't harvest them too much. We do sometimes for when, when it's appropriate to do so. But uh, I like to leave the best ones there for the acorns. Yes, right? sir. Uh, and, and uh, we are fortunate to have some wetlands as well. So we got some really good duck habitat. And we also have one uh, man-made, uh, it's a small one, but it's a drain and flood duck pond. It, the, the pond itself is about 10 acres. And uh, we have the means to, we have a well and a pump to fill it up if oh, we don't get the rain. Oh, that's nice. That's right. a great that's size nice too. Right Cause it, isn't it fun <laughs> to mess with it and landscape it when you can drain it and do things, you know, because a lot of ours we can't drain. And I've, I've always like, I've probably been 15 years. I want to plant a grove of trees here and there, but some of our stuff we can't really drain and control like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's nice to be able to do it. You feel like you got to paint and then you go back and paint and paint in subsequent years, you know. Oh, well, that's right. And, and of course, we plant some corn, but we've also had a lot of success with golden millet. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. We include that, that in our millet blend now, isn't it right, Bobby? Yeah, we do, yeah. Yep. Thought so. Yeah. That's good stuff. Works really well. Yeah, man. That's awesome. What a, you know, he's hit the, he said postage stamp on the burning, but you listen to his comments about <clears throat> the jewel of a place he has. It's so diverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's and that's where we, everybody we talk to that has experience, especially biologists above all else, they go back to the same thing diversity, diversity, diversity. Diversity wins. Yeah, yep. I saw a photo of you and maybe some of your family members with straps of wood ducks. Uh, I'm assuming near that duck hole. Uh, that, exactly, yes. I, I know the photo you're talking about. It was family members, absolutely. Uh, but as long as we're talking uh, diversity, I would love to mention uh, about the American Chestnut Foundation. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Near and dear uh, to us. I'm very happy to work with those guys. And they, they have a brand new documentary out that uh, it would be good for people to Google up and to watch. Uh, there's been some success in breeding 15 16th American chestnut to 1 16th Chinese chestnut to have some resistance to the drought. And the other technology being used that I find really interesting is uh, genome technology, where they're actually injecting uh, a gene into the uh, young trees that give it a, a resistance to the drought. And, wow. and this is a, this has the potential to be a faster, um, uh, situation because, you know, breeding the 15th, 16th, the one sixteenth, you have to do it over and over and over right. again, right. takes, takes years and years, but the genome technology can move a lot faster. So fingers crossed that that, uh, turns out to be a positive thing yeah. for us. That's wow, an that's interesting, the first I've heard of that. Yeah. It's an Does interesting it? project. Uh, we probably need to podcast. Uh, uh, in fact, Will Primos recommended, uh, the gentleman that runs the New York chapter that, we ought to podcast with to learn more, but yeah, they're, um, Especially. using, uh, they're using genetics from the wheat plant, uh, -huh. uh yes. to keep the blight at bay in the chestnut. Exactly. So could it so be, they've got a pure American chestnut and, and it's called, yeah. And it, uh, the name of the actual cultivar or selection or whatever is called darling 58. Well, you let your know it so, yeah, so hey, up? let me ask you this though. <laughs> Does that pass along to its, yeah. Seed. So that it yeah, that would be so line. important. Where the the crossbreeding, the fifteenth, sixteenth, we've known about that for fifteen or more years. Yeah, we that doesn't that. pass along. Right. And okay. it's it's interesting. And, wow. and all the chestnuts, like uh there's also an Ozark mm -hmm. Chinkapin Foundation, which is a uh, another mm -hmm. native chestnut. It's a one seeded chestnut. Right. And uh they're based out of Arkansas. We did podcast with them and uh we're hoping to start an orchard. So it's another native chestnut that has timber form. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, interesting <clears throat> stuff. We need to send chucks for trees. Yeah, people We're need to understand the trees. Yeah, that the uh, the 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 American landscape used to be what dominant dominated by American by chestnuts. East, east of the Mississippi, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, through the Appalachian area mainly up in the mountains, but uh, but it it extended a little bit beyond that as well. Uh, but uh, wouldn't it be great to bring the, the oh, tree back? One hundred percent. Oh man, that would be. You talking about something gives me chill bumps thinking that as we speak before our time passes here on Earth that we would have been a part of something like that. Yes. And and restoring them so that that's the first I'd heard about the genome mm -hmm. research. Yeah, that's too. incredible, Dudley. Hmm. so chuck let me ask you a serious question so can you remember back at, at whatever point it was in your life where you stood looking at a forest and you just b became fascinated and decided i'm just really gonna be interested in this and learn more about it what what event led to that happening good question well you know being uh being a child of the 60s we all remember the uh pollution and the challenges that uh we had back then and there was this growing feeling of what are we doing to the environment and then of course uh you know in in the 60s things started to change well 70s i should say uh, uh, they established uh, the agencies that started looking after the land and and we started doing better but you know i grew up in alabama guys right next door to you guys there and uh i just remember you know the 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 the, the phrase that we use for Alabama is Alabama, the beautiful. And uh, it, it is. is a beautiful state. It and is. when you ask my first memories of, of just, you know, for a time when I was very young, six, uh, six and seven years old, we lived in the country in Montgomery, outside of Montgomery. Wow. And uh, we had a little eight acre place. Uh, we had three horses we were surrounded by forests and and uh i just remember so what playing in the creek with with my sister you know just hanging out in nature and enjoying it so it, that's my first memory of wow isn't this cool you know uh to to be uh, living in nature and be able to be a part of it and uh you know we'd, we'd find snakes in the barn and all of the things that go along with country living uh, back then. So that's that's my earliest earliest memory of it. Wow, that's great. There's just you know for everybody listening out there too. There's something medicinal for your life and your spirit. I don't want to get too kooky on folks, but it is it, in planting a tree and yeah. and adding to what's going on in the earth is supposed to taken away from. There's something so medicinal, and I hope that people that you know that grow up in in uh, urban environments you know, can even do that, you know, even in their yard and stuff, everybody would participate mm -hmm. yeah. everywhere. It, it, it adds so much. In fact, it's actually, I think it's proven now. We, there's another podcast talk about, they have these recovery centers for people and they use pets and nature and they plant things and they, yeah. you know, work in flowers and plant gardens. And actually they are healing people with nature more and more. It's fascinating. Well, and, and Chuck, I, I just watching the tree man, uh, you made me aware of a quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson that I never heard before, and it's in the woods we return to reason and faith. That's awesome. Yeah. You, Mister Know It All. I, 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 I tell you, know, I write some stuff down, Richie. <laughs> uh, Chuck, it, it was it was a real enlightening moment. It for was. Me. Who was Ralph well, Waldo? I, I don't know. I know who Chuck is. You know, I don't read much, but I do listen to music. I do love that quote. And, you know, I, I think it's so true. You know, we, we all have parts of our lives. You know, when I'm out touring with the Stones or with others, you're in big cities with electric atmospheres and horns honking and and uh, the just all of the vibrations that you get from <laughs> doing that kind of thing. And, yeah. and for me, you know, when you take that I get home and take that walk in the woods. It's, it's so healing. Oh God. And it also helps to keep me grounded. You know, it makes me understand what's really important in life and what the priorities uh, should be. But I loved your comment about how um, a, a lot of people with PTSD or, or other maladies uh, psychologically are being healed by spending time in nature, spending time with animals and that kind of thing. So you know, there, there's a lot to that. And I think we could all use as much of the uh, dose of nature as we can get um, out there. You know, I think Absolutely. it's so important. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, even in inner cities, guys, and I know you all know this, but even in the inner cities, when you can create uh, green spaces, parks, yes. Uh, in Atlanta, here in, in, in the state of Georgia, uh, they came up with the Beltline, which was the old tr uh, train 
um, route that circles around the city and they've planted beautiful trees and have little parks along the way. Anytime that we can help do that in the metropolitan areas, I think it's so helpful uh, for people to get a dose of that. Yeah, we actually have some of our trees growing on that belt line mm -hmm. that, that we sent uh, somebody five or six years ago. Yeah. And I love that, you know, you guys mentioning just the effort of planting a tree and watching it grow through years. Oh you know, we, we plant uh, trees for our grandchildren and, you know, name them after the grandchildren. Uh, you know, when we have the loss of a loved one, we usually plant trees yes. in memory. And uh, so th these are things that can stick with you, you know, s stick in your heart. Uh, it helps you to remember the good times that you spent with people or the good times you spent with your children when they were growing up or grandchildren. Uh, so it's a great exercise to do. And I'd, I'd like to see it happen more and more in schools, you know, and, and it is happening. You get uh, it, schools that have some outdoor classroom uh, property and they can uh, maybe grow some vegetables or hopefully uh, engage in planting trees around their, uh, their places. Absolutely. We're seeing more and more of that, and that's, that's a good thing. Moultrie was first in feeders since 1979 and is the leader in total game management. They're taking feeding to another level with the new Ranch Series line of durable and versatile feeders perfect for both wildlife and domestic livestock. So Dudley, you can feed your goats. Whether you're a deer hunter, a hobby farmer, a land manager, or a rancher, Moultrie has you covered with several kit options including a rotating auger, broadcast, or a gravity kit. And these feeders are 300 or 450 pounds. They're big feeders. All right, so guys, Moultrie is offering our listeners a 15% site-wide discount at MoultriefEeders.com. Use code Mossy Oak with a capital M, Mossy Oak, at MoultriefEeders.com and get that 15% discount. The Furminator is the industry's most versatile piece of food plot equipment, allowing plotters to do every step of the process, working the soil, adding seed and soil supplements, and compacting. From start to finish with a single implement, it's hassle-free by design. Set it for the seed size and simply drive the tractor and the Furminator does the rest. Check it out at theferminator.com. So, Chuck, I, I'm going to ask you another serious question. And uh, so, in my mind's eye, I picture maybe on as you tour with the Stones on some Tuesday night, you guys are probably hanging out in the green room before you go out on a concert, and you might be watching the Gamekeepers and Mossy Oak television show all <laughs> of, course, I, of course, yeah. course. Picture, I'm picturing that. I'm sure Mick It's Mick's it favorite speed, show, yeah. man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but at, at, so, as you guys, as you travel, and you mentioned it earlier, the electronic vibrations of this circle that you sometimes travel in to make a make your living and 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 you're so good at what you do and we're just so impressed but I, my point that i'm trying to get around is is there a way that you see that we as hunters could portray ourselves better to the non-hunting public is there any advice that you could give us from hearing from that other side and what they think of us ways yeah. that we could improve a great ourselves? question you know, it, it is a great question, and it, it is a, a challenge that we all face. And again, you know, that was the reason I started this effort in writing books and the effort with the television program, uh, because I, to answer your question more directly, in my opinion, if we engage in parts of nature, parts of the environment that are not directly related to hunting so much and you you show songbirds for instance you know look we have a great appreciation for songbirds in the outdoors uh take take the kids on a nature trail and start yes. identifying different trees and different shrubs uh it's it's great if you have a biologist uh, a botanist uh that can we have a nature trail here at charlene and we enjoy taking uh, young children's groups into the woods walking the trail and you know you may see a, a fallen tree that's been dead for five years and you look at the insects what's happening and what's if this tree is going back into the earth and so so I, I think the point is if you can talk more about uh the environmental aspects and and then slowly you know get people more comfortable with what we do as as um managing the wildlife right yes uh show them those tracks in, in the in the dirt right so wow look at that turkey track you know uh look at these deer tracks and how do you identify 
um, the male deer from the female deer. And so I, I think if we can get them excited about those aspects of the outdoors, then we get them more comfortable with, uh, you know, where, where we put uh, that venison on the table and how that whole process works. Mm. Beautifully said. No yes. doubt about it. You know, our, uh, I have to get this blurb in there, but it's, it reminds me, the whole conversation today is, you know, in my position is like, you got to be sure that everything's focused, everything's logical. Lanny gets an earful from me about that sometimes. And, you know, great mission statements. I and mean, we got this diverse brand now, but you got to have that central mission. And a great mission statement usually is like as few words as possible, encapsulating everything, you know. So what I came up with years ago for my own kind of private managing things, like what we do as a brand is connecting humans with nature. And I have to say, you make a really excellent point about uh, short phrases and, and what we that, that have spent some time in front of cameras uh, hmm. call sound bites. You know, uh, it, when I sign uh, my books that have to do with forestry, I usually use the phrase, wood is good. That's you know. awesome. That's a great one. Dudley's yeah. going to poach that one from you. I can see him now. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, one of the books I like is Growing a Better America, Smart, Strong, and Sustainable. And that's solid. that's a good one. Yep. Oh, thanks, is. man. Thank you for that. You know, the impetus for that was traveling around <clears throat> and seeing, and we've all seen this uh, in our communities, strip malls that are built mm. and then five, seven years later, they're abandoned and there they are sitting useless, you know. And uh, so the, we're going to grow as a country. I mean, that's inevitable. We are growing. We've always grown. We're going to continue to grow. But is that growth going to be rampant, rack, reckless, or can it be smart, strong, and mm -hmm. sustainable? And that, that's the point of the book is, you know, how can we deal with this ever-growing population, but be smart about it and uh, protect nature as much as we can? We better and, listen. We better listen because yeah. Mother Earth is not going to forgive, you know. It's That's not. Right. Chuck, we got uh, Mac, our fact checker, is uh, raising his hand with a question for uh -oh. you. So uh, with watching uh, the Tree Man documentary, uh, I thought it was really interesting about how you said that your, your mom would ask you to play a sound like thunder on the piano, and it reminded me of my grandmother and with my kids now. And so with that, what would be your favorite sound in nature? Or what's something oh. that puts you at ease or that excites you? Or what's a sound that you, makes you smile? The wind in the pines. Wow. wow. That's, That's a, a good, good one. one. That That's is a such one. a good one. Man, I can hear it now. I can too. Maybe yes. a few crows in the background. Ooh. Yes, and yes, sir. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the crunch of leaves underfoot. Mm. Yeah, wow. that, that does good. Chuck, are y'all's musket irons about over now? Has, <laughs> has it been a good year in, in Georgia? Uh, we've had great rainfall this year, and I'm so grateful for it. You know, we've seen some storms, of course, uh, in South Georgia and in and, and Florida as well, as you guys know. But uh, fortunately, we've been spared for any uh, bad damaging uh, storms. And the rainfall, we have a surplus. Uh, so all my trees are happy. Of course, I, I've never seen as much natural reproduction in my life as I've seen this wow, year. I mean, I've awesome. seen so many little, you know, young pines that are literally half an inch, one inch, and just thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So uh, it's been a good year for reproduction. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. You'll and, probably see a great crop of wild critters coming in behind it too. Usually a burst yeah. in winter nutrition it makes for a better, you know, hatch and turkeys and everything. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hopeful on the turkey hatch. I, I haven't been able to, uh, you know, get out there and uh, investigate as we do, you know, specifically to see turkey tracks and what the population has looked like and the, and the poults and all that. But uh, I think you're absolutely right. You know, that rainfall, when you have a good year of rainfall, it usually affects everything and everything flourishes. So hopefully that's the case. Mm -hmm. Lanny, look like you got a question. Well, I mean, if you watching you play the keyboard, it is amazing. And for me, who is personally hard for me to chew gum and walk at the same time, <laughs> I, I just have to ask, I mean, are you ambidextrous? How do you pull that off? <laughs> 
You know, there's a lot to do with the left brain, right brain thing and left hand, right hand. Um, one of my mentors and uh, someone that I met when I first came into the Stones was a gentleman named uh, Ian Stewart that we affectionately call Stu. Stu was actually the founding member of the Rolling Stones. He put an ad in the paper uh, that was uh, asking for musicians that love the blues to come uh, and, and play. And so Mech and Keith showed up and eventually they became the Rolling Stones. Well, anyway, Stu had a great left hand and he was an excellent boogie woogie player. And if you not understand the style of boogie woogie, the left hand is doing a certain pattern and then the right hand plays more freely. Well, I asked Stu, I said, Stu, how do you get that left hand and, you know, the independence thing going? And he said, Chuck, hold your, uh, tie your right hand behind your back, uh, play that left hand figure until your hands hurt and then play it some more. And then wow. you can release your right hand and play one or two single notes <laughs> until you can, you know, eventually just keep growing and growing and, and trying to get that independence. But uh, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a craft. Uh, it takes a lot of practice, uh, by no means am I the expert, but, but I do enjoy dabbling. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Really that, is. It's I gotta amazing. say, so a true it, gift. Yeah. It, here's, here's my bragging for the day for him. I, Cause I remember hearing Mick talk about his musical influences early on. And one of them is a true, true pioneer is from here. The Howlin' Wolf mm -hmm. is from West Point, from West Mississippi. Point, Mississippi. Oh, man. Sure is. And I remember seeing Mick talk about his many musical influences early on, and we mentioned that name. He just gave me chill bumps because that's one of – we have the Howlin' Wolf, Howlin Wolf Blues Festival here every year. It's actually coming up this weekend. Yeah, how about that? The answer is. So, anyway, I thought that would hit a note with you, too. It's pretty cool where you got someone like that from here. He doesn't sometimes get enough, I think, you know – yeah attention now we from the uh, yeah we're from the blues hands for yeah sure. we we mm. pulled in eric gales uh, a couple years ago that was awesome yeah uh eric was here just a few days ago in macon playing a concert with uh, buddy guy who's uh, of course on his uh, farewell tour buddy guy is 87 years old that's still crazy. out there before. yeah Isn't that's that amazing great? yeah <laughs> first first time I saw Buddy Guy play, uh, I was at my farm, at my cabin uh, when I was a kid, and uh, we had a black and white, like a six inch TV screen, and Austin City Limits came on. Yep. And I saw Buddy Guy, you know, playing with his teeth and behind his head and stuff. And I can't I was believe like, you don't have your Austin He's City the man. Shirt on. So, <laughs> all right, Chuck. Max raising his hand one more time. What you got, Max? So with a, a conservation forward mindset with timber production and harvest, what do you think is the sweet spot for basal area and, and what you like to cut? That's what I had written down to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a one word answer either. Good question, Mac. And I think you're no, referring to pines, right? Yes. yes. Well, you're right. It's not a one word answer because as we know, we go through different phases. You know, when, when you plant seedlings that are six inches high and you're planting them uh, usually in uh, about eight to 12 feet uh, apart and then maybe six feet uh, in the in between the trees and, and the rows right. uh, as you go along the rows. And then, of course, as time goes on, you're going to start thinning. Uh, so it the I don't think that you can really say what is the ideal because eventually you, you want to get to that maturity, right? And then right. what is your goal? Is your goal to have a production forest so that you're really going to concentrate on the economic value of the trees? Or if you're like me, is the goal more a combination of wildlife habitat and forestry going forward? So, you know, in our case, uh, we have different tracks that have different age groups on them and we manage them according to of course what the age group is and what's required but um you know i, I think for someone like myself that's not in it just for economic purposes uh you know i i'm going to probably have a a, a much lower uh, basal area than someone that's going right. to be growing a productive forest so mm -hmm. it, it's a difficult thing to answer uh it really depends on your goals and, and you know, what, what you're trying to do with the land. I've noticed more and more of the larger management groups, whether they're, you know, paper companies or, you know, large landowners tend to do exactly as Chuck. And they tend to 
harvest a few more in the at thinning. And for economic reasons, they're getting to saw timber quicker that way, too. But, uh, you know, good old saying, another great uh, one-liner for conservation is, nothing good happens until sunlight hits the ground, <laughs> you know. Oh, that's right. So that kind of goes into what he's saying. I, I've always said, let the, let the, let the stand tell you, because another thing, yes. if you've got really good cutters to get the junk out of there, you right. know. Too. Yes. In some places, you know, you might be down to 60. In some places, you might have as much as 80. It just depends on the stand that you have. Mm-hmm. That's a well, great that's question. That's exactly right. That, that it, It's so true. And, and you know, there's an art to everything, as we all know. But, and there's certainly an art to, to forestry, you know, to the practice of forestry. And one of the things that concerns me a little bit these days, uh, and believe me, as, as you guys know, there's some great institutions. Uh, the University of Georgia has the Warren Ellis School of Forest Resources, great school. Auburn has uh, fantastic agricultural and, and forestry programs, Duke University, um, and on and on. There's some great institutions. But the thing that I wish they would do more of that they did in the old days is to get those foresters out into the field and teach them what boots on the ground and marking trees is all about. You know, if you have a operator select, which is of course means the person that's in that big machine cutting down trees, uh, he can't look at that whole tree up and down. He can't see if there's a crook in it, if there's a fork in it. And a trained forester that's going to be walking the ground, looking around, seeing, you know, where the healthy trees are, where the unhealthy ones. And as uh, you mentioned a moment ago, if you take the lesser trees out as you go through this process and you're going to have a healthier and healthier forest as time goes on. Amen. We Thanks. learned that in forestry. Yeah. See, I learned too. I got upset when they took out too many in one track and, there were some, but they were some really skilled. Chris Hawley helped me find them. They were really skilled at what they were doing. The operator had the eye part, which is not that common, as you know. But anyway, I got to an area that they'd over harvested, and I just got so upset about it. And it turns out it's one of the most productive attractions to wildlife because when we burn it, so much more good stuff than comes back. Because it still, after eight years, it hadn't canopied completely, and there's a lot of stuff to eat. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'd say the same thing in answer to Max's question for me is diversity. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. if you let them go, go get the junk out, you're going to have a, have a different, every acre is going to be different. I was reading an article about a, a forest in the Northeast where they only remove the inferior trees. And in the end, after, I don't know if it's been managed that way for like psh, 60, 70 years, it's ended up being higher, more productive than it was before they were harvesting the good trees. Another thing he pointed out is so critical is like, cause when you clear cut, pines you can go right back in like growing soybeans or corn you know it's just on a longer rotation but when you completely clear cut hardwoods and i know that's a lot of forestry strategy believes in that then um you know you won't see it again in your mind i mean if my kids lifetime really to be harvestable i loved what he said though he was harvesting hardwood select but he wasn't harvesting just for money because you know around here people of every 10 or 15 years they go in so they cut their hardwood, but they're high grading it. So they're getting the preferred species out of there because they're just going for dollars. He's going for preferred species. Then the stuff I want out of there, right. you know, this Preston winter's track is just un- incredible. Great there's a, there's a bottom here four or five miles long. And for this guy had a dimension mill, which is ax handles and hoe handles and stuff. And for 50 or 60 years, he wouldn't allow an oak tree to be planted. So when he passed away, he left it to Mississippi State and a, and a, I guess a trust, uh, a foundation. And so they when they cut a record board feed off of one acre of cherry bark oak that they've ever registered anywhere, and it was just like this park for miles of nothing, and it had so much wildlife. Now subsequently, they've had to go in and harvest differently now. But my point for him was over time he was taking the stuff out to make room for the wildlife preferred species. And next thing you know, it was incredible. Right. That's what he does. Yeah, Boy, that's the thing to do if you care about the wildlife. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. Well, gentlemen, listen, this has been really, really great <clears throat> to spend time with you. Thank you so much for inviting me on to the show. Uh, I hope we can do it again sometime. Is that yeah. a possibility? Yeah, I yeah, hope so. Sure Chuck, we really to. enjoyed it. And yeah. uh, best of luck in your travels and uh, Hackney Diamonds. I'm hoping for a tour. Yeah, uh, I love the new Me single too. "Angry." Yeah, so 
Well, and Chuck, uh, uh, we do appreciate you being on here. We are fans. We're going to promote you so on the social media and encourage everybody to, to watch your documentaries stuff. and 100%. your books. Absolutely. And we're cheering for you, and we'd like to do this again. And uh, look, uh, we're going to let you be like a tree. And leave. And leave. <laughs> He's known for the cornball. So that's that's just, there's more where that came from. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, listen, great, great discussion, guys. Thank you for all you're doing at Mossy Oak. Uh, you guys are great promoters of conservation and, and the environment. So uh, let's stay in touch. And here's to next time. There you go. Absolutely. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Get this guy some trees. See you. Yes. Wow. What an interesting guy. 100%. Unbelievable. So I want to encourage everybody to, there's so many topics and he's done so many inspirational things and we touch them, but just, just Google his name, Google these different and we'll, we can post them too. There's, oh, yeah, there's the such man, a America's multitude forest. of things for people to, and the other thing I would encourage people to do is, is that, you know, because of his name on some of this, people that wouldn't normally pay attention to it might. Exactly. So if you're That's out right. there and you're a follower of gamekeepers and you love what we're doing, Pass along the information about Chuck to some people you want to influence in the right way for, you know, trees, wildlife, and so forth. He is the perfect vehicle yes, for that. Yes, he absolutely him. is. Especially he, people on the fence. He's done so many things. We didn't, I don't, some of the stuff I learned in the Tree Man movie and reading on him, he didn't even mention today. There's more than we even mentioned. Oh, no. Yeah. It's just incredible what a life and what a, what a, Trail he's blazed for all of this. Yeah, I wanted to get a marriage tip from him. Uh, anybody yeah. been married fifty years? Uh, <laughs> hey, in fifty years, and and in the profession he's in. Yeah, I mean, I, you can definitely tell the the yin and yang is him. His piece is at his farm. You know, uh, forty one over here now. Oh, look at you! How about that? We'll yeah. listen to him too. <laughs> <laughs> they say the first forty five are the toughest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> All right. Well, gosh, Dudley, I know you're, you had these rapid fires. I did. Uh, I know you had them. So let's save them. We'll get him again. We're going to get him again. Okay. Mac had a trivia question. Mac, why don't you ask Toxie the trivia question? Oh, that's That'd a good great. one. Let's see. Let's see if Toxie. Yeah, because my phone a friend is Bobby. So if I can't answer it, I'm going to leave it to him. So. We're going to make it pretty easy. Wait a minute, it. wait a minute. If this is a Chuck, one you, this you is, paid up for Chuck? This is. Yeah. Then I'm going to I'm going to fail. I okay. actually think you've got a knowledge. No. Okay. About this. So this will be a true or false question and you're playing for Turner 4400 and the prize is a Gamekeeper edition wood duck box. So, just oh, so man. you know Turner whether I get this right or not, you're going to get the box. <laughs> right. <laughs> Cuz I get to, I get to make that So call. it's 50-50. So, the true or false? Coulter pines are most easily identifiable by their massive spiny cones, which can be as long as 20 inches and are the heaviest and largest of any true pine pine cone, weighing up to eight pounds. Coulter pines? I would just have to say true, guessing it. It is true. Eight Look pound pine cone. Yeah, uh, I picked some. Uh, they're out west. Yeah, in the west you brought US. some home. Yeah, I brought, I brought some that were like a measured one was thirteen inches long. That's big. Yeah. Thank you, Mister. That's yeah. a giant pine cone. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remembered you saying you brought some back. So. We did. I bought. I got a, a garbage. Sack. I still use them for Christmas decorations. That's hilarious. <laughs> My grandmother. We uh, took. Yeah, we had a plane out there so i just like well, take back what i want so i got two black garbage bags full of those big long pine cones and brought them back they're called mac they're called <clears throat> culture pines yeah is there a more of a slang name dudley that people? no um but that's funny you say that my my mom and grandmother used to like fly to san francisco wow. get, get in a car go collect pine cones and, and fly them back i have closets of Pine big cones. pine cones. You know, they had great big pine cones, but the this one you're talking about had they were long or big and long. I think that might be a sugar pine. I'm I'm terrible on my western they're pines. They're huge. But. They're huge. I mean there's Well, Turner forty four, you're gonna get a box. Well, he was gonna get one anyway. Yeah. You know, the right guy. I've so. got a funny story about uh the pine cone collection. So when I was a kid I had a pet hamster and its its name was Harriet. And uh <laughs> One time it got away, and we just forgot about it. We, I didn't see it. I thought it had died. And about two years later, we found it in the closet of pine cones. Yes. It had been living off the, the seeds of the Christmas pine it cones. It lived for two for years two in years. your closet? Yes. Wow. No moisture? <laughs> what was it drinking? My mom was – it freaked my mom out. I had no great. idea. 
Here's another pine trivia thing. Out when I was in uh, New Mexico, their turkeys in a lot of that area, they have to live off the pine seed and the pine nuts to survive. So when they have a mass failure on pine nuts, they have a terrible time raising turkeys and keeping them. I didn't know that the pine could be such a valuable food source in areas of the country. It is. Yeah. Squir- I think squirrels store those things, too. They build what they, they, they call middens where they squirrel store. That might be what they call them. I don't but know. But they're pine remember. nuts. They're tall. What's the small pines that grow that put out so many pine nuts? Our oh, pi- pinyons out yeah. in the southwest. So our 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 uh, short leaf and slash or whatever down here don't. That's a different seed, right? They're much smaller. Yeah, but yeah, like those pinyons. Uh, you know what's that? You can make pesto out of them and all kinds oh. of cool stuff. Wow. All right. Well, why don't we get on out of here? Let Dudley and uh, Lanny go burn, burn. whatever they're going to do. Let's go set some fires. Yeah. Burn fire, bu- fire, yeah. fire, 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 <laughs> fire. Be, oh, be, be that careful. Looking at Dudley. It's about that time. Why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Get us out of here, Richie. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine and don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.